Hey guys, welcome into a new video and a new series I want to do this season. For those of you who don't know, what I do during the game is not necessarily all radio focused. I'm over on the television side of things, working with Valley Sports Wisconsin, researching, looking up historic figures, looking up StatCast, and, and that sort of thing. This stuff has always fascinated me, and I, I really think, you know, just judging from my Twitter mentions and DMs that I've gotten over social media, it's, I, I'd love to do what you do. And I've realized maybe there's people that want to see how I do it. So the whole point of these videos, I hope to do these weekly 10 to 14 days, something in that regard, where I just sit here on my computer, I'll chop it up as we go, and, and take you into the process of a few notes that maybe I noticed from a series or from a week of games, and things that I want to just maybe explore a little bit more. Maybe nothing ever comes of this, you know, on a telecast where the graphic gets in, or maybe this is a conversation that's too complex with the pitch clock era of television, or we just ran out of time on the post game show to talk about it. These are just sort of things that catch my eye. I think people are interested in, and I'll accompany these these uh, vignettes, if you will, with articles over on WTMJ.com. And I remind you, over on the 620 WTMJ YouTube page is where all of my post-game shows are. So this channel is more for the content side of things, interviews, um, this sort of thing, maybe some other things down the road here coming up. But the official 620 WTMJ is where you can find all of my post-game shows live all season long. This is for the nerds, and this is for just generally... Uh, baseball curious people that just want to sit here and maybe we can learn something new along the way shall we so I've got 10 bullet points here from my notes this week from my scorebook of things I wanted to look up on baseball savant and what I'm going to really try to keep myself and hold myself honest on in this series is only use things that are publicly available so baseball savant I have access to the full gamut of of StatCast, and hey, I don't want to out myself and show everything on the backside of things, not that it's like super secretive or anything like that, but I, I just want to show that there's a way that the fan can get nearly as much as what we get on the media and on the research side of things. I'll also use Baseball Savant and StatHead when the time calls for it, but that I do pay a subscription for, absolutely worth it if you're asking me with the StatHead subscription, and uh, I hope you enjoy this process as much as I do. Let's jump into it. Uh, my first note that I had written down here is research Elvis Peguero sinker. So this is how my process begins generally. I'm coming to Baseball Savant, and it's as simple as going to Elvis Peguero's player page. Let's go ahead and take a peek here, shall we? So it, right now it's defaulting to last year. Great ground ball rate, great extension. Now this has been one of the main keys of the Brewers, really, the last few years, is identifying guys that have elite extension creating perceived velocity, creating their lower half and ground force in order to become more effective pitchers. And as everybody is on the cutting edge of things in pitch design and what's next for player development, extension has been one of those numbers and tools or identifiers, if you will, of saying, hey, this ERA numbers or certain numbers aren't quite matching up with what it should be. Like, let's say there's a lot more blue here than you would expect as opposed to red. You can look at that extension number and be like, well, if he's got a red extension, he should be better than what he is. And Elvis Piguero is a great example of what he's doing. The big thing I want to touch on is the sinker, right? This, he's a sinker slider. He is so 50-50 sinker slider from last year right here. You see his usage. Let me just go ahead and look at the movement down here, okay? Vertical movement for a sinker is not, it's kind of a, a, a fake name, right? It, it, it sinks, but it's sinking because it's an arm side thing. If you ever hear that term, if you're not familiar with it, Arm side, glove side, think of it from a pitcher's perspective, right? If I'm a right-handed pitcher, right, and you're the batter, I'm looking at you and I'm pitching, my arm side run means the ball is going to move toward my right side, and I'm right-handed, so it would go in to a righty and vice versa. With a lefty on the mound, if I want to throw a slider glove side, that means it's that. So you don't necessarily say, oh, on the outside corner or on the inside corner. You, you label it as arm side and glove side to make it easier because – you know, obviously righties and lefties change what's inside and outside. So I digress. What I'm going to look at is horizontal movement. And just go ahead and get the total inches down here from his sinker. It's a, pretty much the same as, as last year, but he it's very early. Let's We still see a, an, a little jump here in the line. 20 inches of horizontal movement. And I tweeted one of these, too. Uh, we come down here to versus the average. These red numbers mean 
it's above average. And the darker red it is, the higher above average that pitch moves. So I want to take this to another level. I can go up here to the search tool. You're going to see me use this tool a lot this season, okay? I'm going to switch the year to 2024. Let's go ahead and check out Elvis Piguero. And we'll go to the pitch type which is the sinker. Uh, we want player and events, and we'll change our included stats. I want to see uh, arm side, glove side movement. I'm just going to see all of the sinkers that he's thrown based on the movement. Player and event sort. So I'm going to change this over to uh, glove side, arm side movement. We'll search it again, and boom, reloaded. So the hardest one he threw, at least movement-wise, is 24 inches of arm side movement, which is absolutely bonkers when you think about it. So we can even tap this icon here and go to this video page and we can watch can the pitch. Right. I know the away broadcast had it better. So here it is. Appreciate the dedication to the racing sausages that's disgusting. though. That, that's absolutely disgusting. Can't wait to see more of it. And if you want to go a little deeper, let's just go ahead and take a peek. Let's eliminate with it being just Elvis Piguero. And let's just go ahead and do the player and name. That way it averages the average glove side movement. Okay, so we'll see other sinker ballers that have insane glove side movement here. If I actually use the uh, proper sort tool here. Boom. Average Michael Tonkin, but he only threw one. So can we change the minimum to 10? Minimum number of results. That's what we want. All right. Ryan Ryder. Uh, Ryder Ryan. Two first names. Ricky Bobby. Uh, 11 pitches. 20, almost 22 inches of arm side. I want to see this. Here's a, is there got any whiffs in here? Yeah, here's a whiff. Oh, on Brian De La Cruz. 2-2. Two, two. That was the time. It's the sinker. Uh, I'm going to watch that again. 2-2. Two, two. I'm going to remember time that name the uh, when the Pirates are in town. Because I've been saying for a little while, the Pirates bullpen need to give them give them a little bit of respect. So, Piguero among guys that have thrown at least 10 sinkers. Piguero's in fourth with 20 inches of arm side movement. So, my suspicions are correct. Elvis Piguero has elite sinker movement. I mean, you got Logan Webb right there, too. We know his sinker is absolutely incredible. So, that's chapter one. Let's go ahead and switch things up now. And the next thing on my bullet was Colin Ray's new breaking ball. If you watched any of his start in the finale of that series, it was being labeled as a sweeper, but it didn't really look like a sweeper to me. This is where I think it's misidentifying because in this first two weeks, first three, four starts, the computer's getting to know what you throw and all of this is automated. Now, if a player wants to rename a pitch, they can certainly do that. They have the ability to override it. But Colin Ray, his breaking ball just had a different shape in my eyes than what it had in year over year. To the vertical break, I want to see if there's a big change here. He's added a little bit more, only two inches of vertical break. What about horizontal break? As opposed, Oh, just one inch, really. So we're still in the early stages of this. We'll go back to the search tool and go ahead and watch all of his sweepers so far from this season, or at least from that start yesterday. So pitch type... And we're going to arrange it by, let's go ahead and say movement. Included stats, we want both downward movement. I'm, I don't need the inverted arm side, glove side. Let's search it. So a, a really big range here. So it was a windy day, maybe tough to get that snap off. Seven inches to 14 inches of glove side, but also a big range of velo here too. If we So 80 to 84 miles an hour velo, I guess that's not that big of a change. That looks like a hanger right here, 31 inches of, of downward movement. That, I mean, seven less than we can go ahead and take a peek here. If it, it is an outlier, we can watch it. Old friend. Yeah, oh, hung hung it, spun it, one. not a good pitch. So that's why those numbers are so bad. But let's just go ahead and go, here, here's a strikeout. Nasty, almost 50 inches of downward movement and about a foot of glove side movement. Maybe a back footer here. And then when he got in the batter's box. Exactly, back foot breaking ball. See, break. I, I know it's being labeled as a sweeper. To me, in my old school brain, I think that's a curveball. But that's something we got to ask Colin Ray about and see what he wants to say. See what's different about this one that really broke on him, right? Three more inches of vert, two more inches of horizontal against... Just lost Dave Freed. Oh, that was nasty. He, was, he just he snapped it so too hard. To uh, I'd love to see, note. actually. I can even go into the spin rate here. 2306 spin on that one, whereas the one where we saw the strikeout was 200 RPMs less. So that would make sense why it broke more. So these are things that I'm putting in the back of my mind, keeping an eye on, saying, okay, 
Let's see if these numbers are going to stay constant. I bet he wants that pitch to be somewhere in the 80 to 82 mile an hour range. That's something I'm going to store in the back of my brain, take an eye on Colin Ray's sweeper. Up next, this one was courtesy of Kurt Hogue of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He identified this for Freddie Peralta and noticing his fastball carry going up. What does fastball carry mean, Dom? Your induced vertical break, meaning when you take gravity out of the equation, how much is the ball appearing to rise on its way to the plate? Reminder, the pitcher is obviously elevated from where the batter is standing and they're throwing downhill. And go back to that extension talk, right, where we're talking about with a guy like uh, Elvis Piguero. Freddie's not the tallest dude in the world. He's listed at six foot. I think that's pretty accurate, obviously, but having almost seven feet of extension as a man that's six foot because he's coming at you and it really helps the ball carry and backspin it on his way over to you. But one thing that Kurt Hogue had noticed, go ahead and pick fastballs, and we're going to go, I don't want it with gravity because this number isn't what I want to see, but you can see the ramp, right? We're going to a minus 12, more on that in a moment from minus 15. Uh, this isn't the number that is going to be telling us that he's having high carry. Yes, it certainly helps paint the picture, but the number we're actually looking for is induced vertical breaks. But again, let's go back to the search function. We can search this as well. In fact, for this one, I'm going to go year over year, 2023 and 2024. Let's go to Freddie Peralta, and we want four seam fastballs, and we want included stat, vertical movement, without gravity okay there's a magnus event i can a magnus effect with spin rate and i can bore you to tears with all that stuff there are a lot of great resources baseball america wrote a piece driveline wrote a piece on all of this sort of thing to help you start understanding this stuff and i just want the player in year because remember we're comparing 23 and 24 and we want to show the movement without gravity anything over 15 is really good anything near 20 is considered elite and we always knew that freddie had a high carry fastball here 15 and a half was his average last year for his induced vertical break in his first start he was popping 19th that's really really good and remember freddie's a guy that can kind of coast at 92 93 and then pop it up to 96 97 when he needs that let me go ahead and go a little deeper into just 2024 now. So we've already come to the conclusion that he's added some, you know, carry, some ride to his baseball. Let me just go ahead and go player and events, and we're going to range it by that vertical movement without gravity. So let's go ahead and take a peek at this now. Man, he had some 25s on here? These must be high. You know, obviously you're going to let go of it high, kind of like Trevor McGill. He's going to be the next guy that I look at here. Uh, as far as this vertical That's that's it a non-competitive 25, which is why it popped off on the page here. But let's go to this strikeout here, a 21. That's elite at 96 miles an hour. Yeah, and Alvarez that, goes down to the high That's where, that if we watch the swing again, and, whoop, it, in his eyes, this pitch is going to be right here in the zone. Okay, top of the zone. Everybody loves seeing an elevated fastball, elevate, celebrate, right? But because it has that carry, and because it has that ride, it's going to end up above his bat. Yeah. See that? Above his bat. See? Above it. That's, that's carry. That's ride. That's impressive stuff from Freddie Peralta. Is there any others in here that I wanted to see? Like here, 92 miles an hour and still had 21 inches of IVB, it's called a ball, so it must be upstairs. Yeah, you just, it just slipped. So that, that's an anomaly. That's not what we actually want there. Here's another strikeout at 94 miles an hour of 19 IVB, which is still absolutely elite coming from Freddie. Now as the papers fly yeah, and that was his last pitch of the game. Once again, let's, let's watch closely here. He thinks, now this pitch was a strike, obviously, according to the game day zone. He swung underneath it because he thought the pitch was going to be where it was. That's a perfect example. Ball is above the bat. Carry. Ride. If it doesn't have that ride, if that's more of like a, a 15 IVB, that ball's out of the yard. That's how it works. That's what fastball carries. And when you think of Spencer Strider, when you think of Garrett Cole, when you think of prime Justin Verlander, that heavy fastball that holds its line and carries all the way to you, that's what you think of. And Freddie Peralta showing off like an ace so far. Next up, let's stay with Velo here, and let's go to uh, Trevor McGill. Trevor McGill, of course, Flamethrower, going to be one of the 
fireman in the back end of the bullpen this season for the Brewers. The Brewers, man, what they did with him last season and him tinkering with that curveball to become a really dynamic one-two punch here last season. Uh, Almost as many strikeouts with a curve as he did with a triple-digit fastball, which is certainly really impressive stuff back on track. Vertical movement and the carry, the things that we're looking for here, the four-seamer is above average, but let's go to the search tool. There's another tool that I want to use in this one that is called perceived velocity. And again, when we go back to go back to Baseball Savant and we go to McGill, we see his extension isn't as high. But wait a minute. It's because the man's already six foot eight. It's going to be hard for him to have elite extension when he's already that tall. When you couple the fastball velo, his extension and his height, there is something we get called perceived velocity. So let's just go ahead and look at his fastball this year. Want included stats to be, we got pitch velo and perceived velo. And I'm going I'm to add Brian Hudson in this search as well, just because he's another six foot eight specimen that does not throw it as hard as Trevor McGill. But I think this will really help paint the pictures. We see McGill at 98 and it looks like 98, looks like 99. Again, the extension is part of this. Whereas looky here, Brian Hudson, six foot eight, doesn't throw super hard, 92 miles an hour, but his perceived velocity is three miles an hour more. Why is that? So let's go ahead and take a peek at Brian Hudson's extension. And remember, he was acquired in a trade from the Dodgers this past offseason. The Brewers really like what they find. He was the guy that was the roster crunch for Yoshinobu Yamamoto being signed. Boom, the extension. This is what we're talking about with Trevor McGill. Trevor McGill's already six foot eight, and he has an extension in the six foot range. Brian Hudson is also six foot eight. And his extension is over seven feet. That's why the perceived velocity is going up. And that's why you're like, wait a minute, it was 92, 3, 93, 92 miles an hour. Why aren't these guys hitting it? It's because it's looking like it's coming at, coming at him faster because he's right on top of them by the time he's releasing the baseball. Now we got one whiff on his fastball to Omar Narvaez. Let's take a look at it from Brian Hudson. Left on left, too. Nemo on deck. Narvaez yeah, when you get up and in like that, left fastball. on left. Good luck. Second strike. It doesn't need to be elite. It was only 92 miles an hour, 91.6 miles an hour. And I say only like I can do it. I can't do that. But store it after one week. Let's see if that stays put throughout the season. If he can continue that perceived velocity, who knows? Maybe he'll add a tick or two of velo by the end of the season as he continues to strengthen those muscles. Next up on the list, uh, I want to look at Bryce Terang's defense. And this is where it's going to be tough in the opening weekend of the year, given the fact that there's not a really that big of a sample size of plays for Bryce Terang, but there is such a great fielding page on everyone's baseball savant and already here in 2024 at second base. All right, no outs above average. He's had two attempts, but there have been some fantastic plays that he made, in my opinion, that certainly should be uh, noted. Uh, but I can go to MLB Film Room. If you haven't been using MLB Film Room, you should. You go over here to watch. You go to search. I think they just call it MLB Search now. Oh, it's still Film Room. But uh, we go over to the filters, and let's select the Brewers. Just make as many filters as you can to make things a little bit easier. 2024, and we want Bryce Terang. We want him as the primary fielder. And everything else we don't care about. Uh, let's see. Were any of these plays impressive? Let's take a One of these days, I'm just going to make a highlight reel of him playing defense. This was one of the plays that I thought of. Yes, he bobbles it. Let me break this down real quick. Okay. Pete Alonzo, as I pause it here, Pete Alonzo is a professional hitter, as we saw this weekend. The dude can hit to all fields. Where it's pitched, it does not matter. He's also a traditional righty slugger. You got to play him the pull. You got to play him a pinch toward the middle. So watch the range here for Terang. I know Alonzo did not get all of this pitch, and he's not a fast runner, which does not add to the stress of this situation. But you can see how far shaded he was toward the middle on this pitch. Right into the right side. What I'm most impressed with with his mechanics here is – a, he kept his feet moving. Watch his feet moving even during the bobble. Never stopped moving. So impressive. Any young second baseman should take note of that. Number two, watch his left arm. Watch his left arm. This is a Ron Washington right here. Kept it straight. I'm trying to pause it right on the moment that he catches it. Gets extended, keeps it out in front of him, and attacks the baseball. 
If he tries to go out in this direction and field that baseball, it's going to play him. Alonso's going to get a knock and things of that nature, and that's right, not going to be fun. Yes, there was a bobble there, but it's early in the year. Everyone's breaking in their gloves. So. But keeping your balance, get rid of it. Know your runner. Know you have time. That was one of my favorite plays of the year. We obviously know Bryce Terang is one of the best second basemen in the game. Uh, then there was the great one with Uribe on the mound in uh, game one. 2-2 two -two coming to Bader. And he hits one on the ground toward the middle with the diamond. Terang now, on the backhand, the throw I the hear, I mean, that's insane. Uh, on, all, on all fronts here, I'm playing it again here. I understand folks two -two are like, oh, well, Willie could have got that ball. Well, you got to remember your runner. Him. It's Harrison Bader, fast runner. If Willie plays this ball out here, he's not going to have time to get rid of it. And you saw how close this was, even with Bryce cutting it off and throwing it on a hop. Okay, Willie would be fielding it right about now, right here, just now getting the ball in his glove. Bryce is already in the transfer. And Tarang on the backhand. That was awesome. And he got him for sure. Great pick by Reese. Really impressive the... stuff. Second basemen don't traditionally have strong arms. That's a good case of where it helps that Bryce has a shortstop background and is able to make that play. On a similar note, I want to go stay in the film room here and stay on defense. And I want to go back to, um, I want to pick now, instead of Bryce Terang, Blake Perkins' play in the last inning of that game in game one. That was very impressive. Let's, yeah, this is it. This is the play I was talking about. One, two coming. Line the other way, sinking fast. Gomer comes per So that looks mundane. I get that. L watch the read here. One, two coming. Line the other way. He's already running, man. He saw that perfectly. On a windy day. So impressive. Now, this is where I'm finally going to go into the research portal. This is where I'm going to use the full extent of StatCast. But first, let me see if I can actually do it in Savant first. Because I've always used the research portal for this sort of thing. He had eight runs above average last year. Run value, I should say. Seven outs above average. Really, really good stuff. There we go. We already got a dot. Catch probability was 50% on that play. 50%. One, two coming. Line the other way. Barrel. Sinking fast. Gomer comes perking. Now, the wind certainly had something to do with it, but his reads have always been phenomenal. Furthermore, we can go back here to 2023, and you'll see more of what I'm talking about. Uh, here's one that's 30%. Here's one that's 55, 60, 15%. So wait, did he make? Yeah, that's an out. So let's see here. Oh, I remember this play. Left field, pretty well hit on the run and making the catch. That's impressive. Perkins in deep left field. Gosh, that's so impressive. Uh, how about another one up here? Twenty percent catch probability. Man, fourth home run now in this series. Left field off the bat of Eddie Rosario. That Jeez, thing's perfect. drifted. What a read. But not enough. And to make Perkins to get to these without leaving his feet, Home just now in this the speed and the sprint speed certainly coming through here. And you pair that with perfect Rosario. routes, that you're going to be a great drifted, defender. But not enough. Really impressive Perkins stuff. On that note, as I praise Blake Perkins, let me go to my next thing here. Uh, let's talk about Jackson Churio and his routes. And don't worry, on the back end of this, I'm going to give him some love and give him some praise. But Churio had a an adventure, to say the least. Uh, in his first weekend being a big leaguer. Granted, catch probably gave him 50%, gave him 70%, so that should be made. But here, let's look at this 50% one. Another full count for Peralta, his fourth already. And Demo rifles one to right field. Yeah, this was a nice play. Was that was a, that was a nice play. I'll give Jackson Peralta, his fourth already. And Demo rifles one to right field. In the but wind, is there. he had a good they read off the bat, the and it was carrying, again, first time in a big league stadium. It's it it's in a visual adjustment. It it really is. So keep that in mind. Uh, how about the seventy percent one? Let's take a peek at that. <laughs> so in theory, this is a play you're supposed Another to make. To right field, on comes Churio, and he makes the sliding grab. So that's what I'm talking about there. With seventy percent catch probability, that tells me right did he have a bad Churio, read? Did he not he get the right the jump off of the bat? So now I'm finally going to go to my research login and uh, go ahead and look back at that place. Okay, now I'm into the stat cast here. Same play that we were just looking at. Line the other way. Cool. Okay. We come down here to a stat cast. Churio. Catch probability, 70%. Distance needed, distance covered. Got that done. The jump. 
That's the big thing I'm noticing here. You ask any outfielder what's the hardest ball to read, it's the one right at you. And I'll give Jackson credit here, the one right at you. Maybe this one caught perfectly in the ribbon board or in the third deck, something like that. But the fact that he had no jump off the bat virtually, this is how far do you cover in the first second and a half from the ball being put in play? So he covered half a foot, which suggests that he stood still. And good, efficient route there. But let's do the simulator. This is a really cool feature of StatCast. Here's, this is the moment the ball is put into play by Alonzo. Watch the brief moment of hesitation in right field. Okay, watch the right fielder hesitate. The ball is being hit right now. Then he goes. Okay, I know it's really hard to see, but that's where that jump is visualized. That's something he's going to work on. The other play that I think uh, Brewers fans certainly remember uh, and had thoughts about was the route he took so let me, let me go and find this 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 play here okay we can see all the metrics he needed 97 feet cat six and a half seconds of opportunity time this should be run a lot of deep counts. as easy yep. as it gets unusual for him. Flies this I, one and again i know it's windy right but wait till wait till i show you the route that he took on this one he, he made the play he made the play but the brewers were very uh critical with his defense this spring training and trying to keep him focused on that side of the baseball. It was Nimmo, not McNeil. Here in StatCast, I can see his route. Okay, that's his route on a pop-up in the shallow right center field. Stay with him. He's going to learn. He's going to get better at this, but that's not a great start. We go check the jump on a 99% catch probability. His jump was back by four feet. <laughs> That's not right. So he was fooled. He was misread it, but he'll get better at that. Stay with him, I promise. On a brighter note, let's go to Churio and let's watch him run, shall we? Uh, because he had some serious bolts already. His average sprint speed is already 28.2. He's got three bolts. So this is last year, okay? Ellie averaged 30.5 feet per second, which is absolutely insane. Uh, if I look at his the stat search here, let me look at running, sprint speed. And this is for the whole season already right now. Of course, Ellie De La Cruz, the fastest man in baseball, as we know. Let's go ahead and look at Churio. He's already got one of the fastest sprint speeds of the year at 30.6. And this actually produced him an RBI, if I'm not mistaken. Let's take a look. Yeah. And that's a double play ball. Double it play ball. No, it wasn't. That's that's fast. 416 out of the batter's box. If you have a lefty that's under four, that's elite. Because remember, you're a little quicker out of the box. 416 from the right side. He's gonna be okay. He's gonna be just fine. That got him his first MLB RBI. Put the Brewers up three to one. Uh that was back on opening day for the crew and the Mets. So I'm really excited to see him run. Uh I'm I'm just enamored with what this kid's potential is going to be. All right, one last one here. Uh, let's go back to StatCast here. And this is generally what happens to my games. I'm just going to open tab after tab after tab after tab. Uh, let's go to Christian Yelich. He hit a homer. Uh, just for fun, look at a spray chart for 2024. Up the middle and a homer. So we can click on that homer. What do you notice about this homer? Start. Yeah, it's hit that to right I noticed two things. Back and it's out of he hit it off of a lefty. Opening day start. And he pulled it. And, it's hit that to and right field. if you watch Yelly every day in 2018 and 2019, you knew this was a big part of his game plan. When was the last time he pulled a ball off of a lefty and it went for a home run? Okay. All right, we come over here. We go to the batter. We go to Yelich. We want to see him pull the ball for a home run against a lefty in the last five, six years. We want the player and year of how many times that happened. So we go ahead and arrange this by year. He did it twice in 2018, seven times in 2019. Then we saw the back issues start to flare up. Once in 2020, once in 2021. Didn't do it at all in 22 or 2023. And he's already got one here in 2024. And he hit it a whopping 108.7 off the bat. Let's see how that compares to the rest of these. 108.7. Harder than that, harder than that. Okay, this one was hit harder. This one was hit harder. Because again, this is 2019 now. This is when he's healthiest and 
we had the juice baseball. Geez, 113. Let's take a look at that one. Six that he has hit on the year. I mean, literally what we're talking about. Look at that. Literally what we're talking about when he was pulling the ball in uh, 2018, 2019, when he was trying to go back-to-back his MVP. There's a fly ball to right field. May have another. Reyes going back, looking up, and it is gone. Christian Yelich with a home run that he has hit on the year. There's a fly ball to right field. May have another. Reyes going back, looking up, and it is gone. That's a good sign. Christian one pulling a homer off a lefty. Hitting it over 108 miles an hour. I'm not saying Ellie's back. I'm not. I'm not jumping the gun here, but love to see that. That's gonna do it. Uh, I I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you want more of it, let me know. Uh, drop a comment. Tell me on Twitter. Uh, share however you want to share. Drop a like. Obviously, I'm pretty new to this YouTube game. I watch a lot of YouTube. I'm not trying to do this to make money. I'm just trying to do this to show how much of a nerd I am. And I think there are a lot of nerds out there just like me that want to learn as much as they can about baseball and about the Brewers. So I hope you enjoyed this video a little bit into my process. Maybe we'll look at some more coming up throughout the season. I uh, hope to see you all at the home opener on Tuesday. And I'll hear you on the radio coming up this week. Post game show on Tuesday after the game as well over on WTMJ. Uh, thank you for watching. Hope you learned something. And until next time, keep on swinging.